Welcome back. This is AP Environmental Science Chapter 4. And today we're going to talk about rain shadows and then we'll discuss a couple different biomes today in this video. And so, uh, first thing that we need to talk about is rain shadows. And in a rain shadow, you have two different sides you have the windward side, and you have the leeward side. And this is how a rain sh uh, shadow uh, takes place. You have evaporation over the ocean occurring, and any prevailing wind towards the uh, landmass is going to pick up that water vapor from the ocean. It's going to pick up that water vapor and take it towards the landmass. As it reaches the mountain range, it's going to increase in altitude like this. When it increases in altitude, it experiences adiabatic cooling. This is when it so when it increases in altitude, the air is going to, there's going to be a less pressure, and so therefore the air is going to expand in volume. It's going to be in greater volume, and when this happens, the air cools down dramatically, adiabatic cooling. When this happens, the water vapor is able to condense, and then that's when we see precipitation come down on this side of the mountain range, the windward side. After uh, it gets past the mountain range, it's now released pretty much all of the, the water vapor from the air. And now it's dry air. It's going to come down the mountain range to a lower altitude, experience adiab adiabatic healing, which is just the opposite of adiabatic cooling. And now it's going to be um, warm, dry air, and, and so or hot, dry air. And so this is when you get an arid on the leeward side, you get a very arid environment like a desert. We experience this in Southern California. If you look over to the San, Bernda San Bernardino Mountains or San Gabriel Mountains, uh, you see a lot of vegetation. But if you were to drive over this, the tops of the mountains, you would then see a lot of desert out in front of you. So that's called a rain shadow. So variations in climate determine the dominant plant forms and then therefore the terrestrial biomes. So really when we talk about biomes, oftentimes we're just going to be talking about the plant growth forms uh, to sort of describe those biomes. Because as we know, uh, the plant growth is really going to be the base of all the food chain and so therefore it's going to determine a lot of what uh, types of life forms can be there. And so uh, climate is a very important factor in determining the distribution of species around the world. We know this uh, because we know that certain organisms can live in certain conditions and, and such. And so organisms have adapted in particular biomes uh, and uh, grow according to the local temperature, oops, spelled this wrong, precipitation patterns. And so organisms are, are going to be really specific to a particular area or biome. And so uh, when we define biomes, it's just the presence of similar plant growth forms in areas per, uh, possessing similar temperature and precipitation patterns. So anytime we talk about a biome, we're going to talk about plants, we're going to talk about temperature and precipitation. Not that animals and other organisms aren't unique and important there, but uh, that's just um, because that's the base and driving force, temperature and precipitation, we talk a lot about that. So tundra, tundra is a very cold climate. A very cold tr climate has no trees and has a lot of low growing vegetation. In the winter, the soil is completely frozen. This is a very important thing. So we call uh, this soil that's completely frozen permafrost and it's completely impermeable and permanently frozen. Uh, and so what happens is roots can't penetrate that soil and uh, a lot of water can't drain down there. That's why therefore this biome is treeless. You can't get the roots down deep enough. And so instead it just has this low growing vegetation. This actually, the tundra, is a very important uh, biome we found. It absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide from the air and so tundra is considered uh, what we call a carbon sink. And we'll talk more about this, but uh, carbon sink is where you're taking a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and not really putting too much more 
back in the atmosphere. The growing season for the tundra is very short. It's only about four months, and it's during the summer months for that biome. So the tundra we find uh, in a couple places, or we, you know, we find in alpine regions. So you see that the tundra is here in a, a mid-latitude region. Well, it's because tundra can be in a very high-altitude mountainous range uh, where you have very little tree and a lot of low-growing plants. But most of the tundra we find is going to be up in these higher latitudes, uh, up in Russia and China, and, or I guess it's mostly just Russia, Alaska, parts of Canada, and Greenland. And so this graph just shows Greenland, but it's basically what you're going to see in any tundra area or biome. This gray shaded area right here are the months that you have a growing season. And in red, you have the uh, average temperature, which is very low, as you can see. And that's because there's not a lot of uh, sunlight intensity. And then average precipitation in blue. This biome, the tundra, is going to be limited mainly by temperature. And so we'll talk about this, but because temperature is lower than the precipitation on this graph, then that means that the temperature is the limiting factor, limiting the growth of plants and such. But in the tundra, you don't have a whole lot of precipitation as well. I will also talk a little bit about tundra and some of the problems that we're seeing in the tundra because these higher latitudes are warming up faster than uh, the rest of the globe. And so uh, what's happening is the permafrost is melting and uh, actually an increase of methane release from bog type areas. The boreal forest is also a very, very important, not, not many people think about these as important biomes, but they're very, very important. This is going to be mainly uh, cone-bearing plants, these evergreen trees. And these evergreen trees can tolerate very cold winters and, and short growing seasons. And so the boreal forest, a lot of cone-bearing plants. This is going to be found between 50 and 60 degrees north mainly in Europe, Russia, and parts of North America. And uh, the plant growth is constrained more by, as we'll see in the graph, temperature than precipitation. The soil in the boreal forest is, uh, is very nutrient poor. It uh, has a very slow decomposition of uh, leaves and whatever plant matter because of the fact that... Uh, there is not a whole, it's not very high temperatures in this region. So the boreal forest also, uh, just, just in case you didn't know, it's also known uh, as the taiga. And so this is also what it can be referred to as taiga. The boreal forest and taiga are the same thing. And you see it spread across this higher la latitude just be below the Arctic. So it's a subarctic uh, biome. And uh, the graph right here is from Ontario, Canada. You see the temperature and the precipitation for this graph should be somewhere right under 100 millimeters uh, per month. The growing season's a little bit longer than the Arctic, and uh, that is something important to note. You can see up here a lot of uh, evergreen plants. You have more, because of the plant life, you're able to have more um, animal life as well. It supports more animal life. Temperate rainforest. Temperate rainforest is a very unique biome. There's not a whole lot of temperate rainforest on earth and so actually North America we're lucky we have a little bit. It's a pretty cool area to be in and it's going to have moderate temperatures and very high precipitation. This is why we call it a rainforest. And so it's in the temperate region, and it's considered a rainforest because you have very high precipitation. And so it's going to typically be on the coast, and this is really all it's found, west coast of Nor uh, North America, so northern California to Alaska. Uh, in Washington, I think it's Olympia National Park. It's a very famous area uh, for the temperate rainforest. Uh, and also are Calif Northern California redwoods. This is in the temperate rainforest. Southern Chile has temperate rainforest. New Zealand on the west coast of New Zealand, which I've been to, has it. And then uh, 
just off of the coast of Australia, uh, the Tasmania Island. What causes this is going to be ocean currents, and you're going to get uh, different fluctuations in both uh, the temperature and the source of water vapor based off these ocean currents. The cool thing about temperate rainforest is a 12-month growing season, so lots of plant life, lots and lots of plant life, and uh, the summers, or I mean the winters are going to be rainy, and summers are going to be foggy. North coast of California, very, very foggy. If we look at the, the graph that we have here, you can see that, well, this global map, there's not a whole lot highlighted. So temperate rainforest is a very rare biome. We have it in Northern California up to Alaska, very thin area along the coast, a little bit of chili down here. And then uh, the whole islands of New Zealand are not temperate rainforest, just the west coast and then a little bit of Australia as well, temperate rainforest. And so you see that the precipitation is, is quite high, and also the temperature goes something like this. And so because these are relatively close, you have a growing season that is 12 months, quite long, and so therefore it supports a lot of plant life. You can see they're very dense forests, Lots and lots of plant life all around, and so therefore can support a lot of uh, consumers as well. So this is where we're going to stop today. There's more biomes to come. Watch for videos on the uh, some more biomes, including marine or freshwater biomes. And then also I'll be doing a couple videos on specific things like just the formation of Hadley cells, uh, just the Coriolis effect, uh, Let's see here, what else? The, the tilt of the earth. I'll put out specific videos for those, so uh, watch for those.